building a green society through learning, my favorite part, doing. We have assembled a very distinguished and diverse group of experts for you this morning. I can tell by the interaction from our first panel that this is not a shy group. So we do want you to prepare to pick their brains and ask them a lot of good questions. But they have a lot of uh, information to provide to you as well uh, because they have dedicated uh, their lives and careers to environmental literacy and promoting ecolo ecological sustainability. They bring their vast experience and commitment to ensuring all sectors of our society owns their unique role, as well as their responsibility in protecting the environment and in preparing our students to be good stewards of the earth that they will inherit. Our panelists here this morning not only will share with you their work, but I know that they will stimulate and challenge your thinking and motivate you to turn that thinking into action. Let's be, again, briefly uh, by hearing from each of our panelists, and I will introduce them in turn, how their work and the work of their organization will help them turn the tide toward increased environmental literacy over the next decade. We're going to begin with Amelia Cowens. She is the Assistant Communications Director and Media Spokeswoman for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Rome. She's also a media strategist. She conducts media training for museum staff and plans media previews to help highlight the museum's public events and special exhibits. Ms. Cowens is a radio and TV personality who charms the airwaves <laughs> as the host of Radio One in Raleigh. She can also be seen on Channel 5 TV as host of the North Carolina Education Lottery. Prior to her work in public relations, Amelia worked in the news business as a producer. As we talk about messaging this important work, I think Amelia has a lot to share with us that I hope will answer some of the questions we heard on that first panel. Amelia, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And you know, the radio and TV personality in me wants to pick this up. So I'm going to do that. Oh, wonderful. Great. Okay, so, um, as Becky said, I am the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences Media Spokeswoman. And um, prior to that, uh, if anyone would have ever told me that I would end up as a PR person in a science museum, I would have laughed in their faces. Uh, primarily because I had science crammed down my throat my entire life. I had a mother and father who were both science teachers fourth through sixth grade for 30 plus years apiece in the Gary, Indiana public school system. So needless to say, every year of my elementary school life, I probably had a science fair project with a roaming solar system or some kind of volcano exploding. And so I, I like in my life, similar to that of a PK or a preacher's kid, who was forced to church on Mondays for prayer, Wednesdays for Bible study, and of course Sundays for church. And I think I did everything in my power to get away from what was inside me all along. And literally, my job fell into my lap. I was the news producer at Channel 5 at the time, and uh, I was producing a show that every first Saturday of the month, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences came and brought a prayer, and I called the woman who had my job, and I said, what are y'all bringing on today? Well, she didn't answer the phone, but my now boss did. And I said, where's Maria? He says, oh, she's not here. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Bing, and sent my resume, and three months later, I had this job. So uh, enough about me, though. I, I think that the burning questions, particularly for me, um, are how do you get the media to cover science stories. And then how do you keep young people interested in science? Now, I'm going to quote just a few findings from a report that I found that is very poignant. Um, it's from the Pew Internet and American Life Project. And basically, that report has 
said that news has moved from a consumable product to a participatory experience. And so in essence, you want to give your viewers, your readers, and young people particularly, something that interests them, something they can participate in. And the way that you do that is moving out of your science sphere and talking to them. Talk to your grandchildren. Talk to your nieces and nephews, your teenage ones. And find out what they're into. And then you want to frame your messages in a way that hits home. I always say to people, tell me about your research like I was your granddaughter. You wouldn't explain it to her the same way you would explain it to a colleague. And it made me get it. And if I don't get it, I'm going to tell you I don't get it. And I'm going to say, tell me again. And I'm going to ask you a few more questions to try to get you to make you, me understand it. Because I'm not a scientist, but I want to learn. So it starts with engaging them. The other thing is you need to embrace and accept the fact that the way people are getting news today is not how they've been getting news in the past. So thanks to Facebook, Twitter, and other forms of social media, it's allowing consumers to tag, share, comment on, and even create news. Now one thing I learned early on as a newsie is that there's a very simple definition of what news is. News is what people are talking about or what people should be talking about. Very simple definition, okay? Now, the thing is, scientists are in a very unique position because there's lots to talk about. You just have to make what's interesting to you interesting to them. And I'm looking for my time, so I guess I'm good. I'm, okay, I'll keep going. Um, and the other thing, because you know, I know they can kind of tap me, hit me, do something. Uh, the other thing, uh, another big finding from the report is that the internet has surpassed print and radio as popular news sources. Now, keep that in mind because the gatekeepers are getting it wrong. How many of y'all are aware that many science reporters and science desks are no longer existent in a lot of newsrooms, right? These journalists have lost their jobs, but guess what? This report basically says the gatekeepers have gotten it wrong. Hopefully, with all of your help, they can rehire those journalists. Okay, now this is what was very interesting to me. They polled internet news users, and what they found was that 66% 66, 66 of all internet news users, 66% follow health and medicine stories. 60% follow science and technology stories. And then when they asked them what they wanted more coverage of, 44% said they want more news on scientific news and discoveries. That was more than any other, in that, that got more votes than any other topic, 44%. So that's something to keep in mind. And later I'll share some insider tips on how to get your stories covered. Well, that was an encouraging. Amelia, thank you. Uh, let's give Amelia a hand. <laughs> Next panelist is Dr. Carlos Rodriguez Franco, who is the U.S. Forest Research uh, Service Research and Development Acting Deputy Chief. He received his doctorate in forest sciences from Yale University and has taught civil culture, forest dance group, and forest sampling at Chapingo Autonomous University and the Colegio de Postgraduates some uh -oh. my Spanish is showing in Mexico. He has written 87 scientific articles on subjects related to forest inventories, forest management, plant production techniques, and agroforestry systems. Thank you, Carlos, for joining us. Please share with us. Good morning. Um, thank you for your kind invitation to be here today. I work with the, the Forest Service at USDA. Uh, I'm going to speak about the America's Great Outdoors Initiative, which was signed by President Obama on the presidential memorandum on 8th April. 
establishing a, this program to promote and support the model at community level. Efforts to conserve outdoor spaces, protect natural and cultural resources, and reconnect Americans to the outdoors. The main objectives are to promote outdoor recreation, advance job and volunteer opportunities related to conservation, educate and engage Americans in natural, cultural, and historical resources, promote locally led or community-based conservation that weeks upon the state, tribal, local, and private priorities, restore and conserve federal lands and waters, and develop science-based tools that directly contribute to the conservation and management of lands. It's in this last part where my work is with the Forest Service is done. The Forest Service has the mission of sustaining the health, diversity, and productivity of the national forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. We do research from boreal ecosystems to the tropics, Science in the U.S. Forest Service study fundamental ecological processes of forest and grassland ecosystems to ensure, to ensure their long-term sustainability and maintain native, native species biodiversity. We are one of the largest uh, forest research organizations in natural resources in the world. We are very well recognized for the quality of science that we develop. We work with land managers of all types and we do technology transfer. Uh, what I want to say about this is that we have a, a great tradition in working and uh, recovering our ecosystems. You should remember the big deforestation at the beginning of the 1900s. The Forest Service established on those days uh, 80, the first experimental forest and start to develop uh, the civic cultural uh, systems to harvest the forest and restore the, the species that were native in those ecosystems. Since those days, we have gone with long, long, long work. Uh, we have now 81 experimental forests uh, covering most of the forest ecosystems in the United States. We do research in several issues like uh, civic culture, forest management, restoration, conservation, water, fire and fire, global change, as well as recreation and human dimensions and economic aspects. And we do have a national laboratory just working in forest products forest, forest products research. And we go from the basic research of studying the biology of one insect of could be native or exotic to nanotechnology, trying to find the best applications of good for new products. So this, this is a big, big spectrum of science. In the broad, broad sense, we want to preserve our natural resources for the future generations. And when we think about it, seeing what are the effects of the current catastrophic disturbances, we have to change our way of doing things. Uh, what I want to say with this is, for example, when you think about global change and the impacts of global change in vegetation, Forest Service has been doing the forest inventory and analysis and monitoring of vegetation since the 1930s. We do now know how different species are becoming better adapted to the new growing conditions. We are seeing the migration of the species from one ecosystem moving to a different kind of growing condition. We have to be thinking about restoration in terms of how we are going to be managing for, for, for forests in the future. And maybe we should be thinking also that what you, we, you or we are seeing today in these ecosystems are not going to be the same in the next 50 years. So we are working on those kind of issues to deliver the science that we are going to need for the future. And conservation education, that is the program that we have in the Forest Service, is part of delivering this technology that we do for kids, for example. But we do this work for all kinds of managers and for whole society. We have, for example, on the web page, 30,000 accessible publications covering any subject in the web. We established something called Climate Change Resource Center, which you can find the basics from climate change to the application in natural resource management at this moment. Of the technology we have. We do 
technology transfer to the web page. Come in, come in. Uh, doing, for example, uh, modeling of one vampire's uh, behavior that is accessible to the people that can do how it's evolving. That. So, in, in short, I'm sorry, it's very short to say what we have to say, but uh, we are trying to do our best in communication and for science and related programs. And we also work with the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, establishing, establishing something called communities of practice in the specific subjects related to forest management and natural resources and science. Thank you for the opportunity. Let's give Carlos a hand. Is reading Carlos Communities of Practice. I like that. Let me just glass it. Next up is Rachel Gutter. Rachel is the director of the Center for Green Schools at the U.S. Green Schools uh, Building Council. She is a popular, huh, Rachel? Ah, oh, right. A knowledgeable speaker. So we're very glad to share some time with us today on the topic of green skills. Passionately advocating for the Green Building Council's vision to achieve green schools for everyone within this generation. Rachel came to the USGBC in 2007 as a market development manager to help launch Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, Lead for Schools, which will uh, lead the establishment of the National Green Schools, Council, uh, Green, green schools Campaign. Rachel received her Bachelor of Arts in English from Tufts University. Rachel, welcome and share with us. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks so much for having me here. It's always good to have a popular person on the panel, so <laughs> happy to play that role. I think you guys somehow got the wrong version of my bio. So. <laughs> um, uh, I, I work for the U.S. Green Building Council. How many folks in the audience have heard of the USGBC? That's, that's kind of a skewed audience. Two years ago, most of you wouldn't have been raising your hands. Um, I think in, in, in the broader sector of the population, USGBC is best known for LEED. How many people have heard of LEED? If everybody has been listening to that, you've heard of LEED, right? Because uh, NEA recently completed its LEED for existing building certification legal project, which we're so thrilled about talking about walk the walk. So, big hand. <laughs> You're breathing in healthy air as you speak. Um, uh, so, uh, USGBC is a nonprofit. We're based here in DC. Um, we are not contrary to popular belief a federal agency, though the name sometimes suggests that. Um, and in addition to the LEED Green Building Rating System, we have a multitude of uh, other initiatives and programs to support a vision of green buildings and green communities within a generation. It ranges from uh, adult education to supporting professional accreditation via the LEED AP and Green Associate tracks, um, to our uh, annual conference, uh, Green Build, which is coming up next month. About 40,000 of your closest green friends are congregating in Chicago this year. Um, and, and the most important, the, the most critical work that we do at USGBC, and of course I'm biased, uh, is the Center for Green Schools. Um, and and uh, as we mentioned before, the, the vision of the center is that everyone will attend a green school within this generation. And that's a really lofty goal when you think about the fact that there are 133,000 K-12 schools, 4,300 campuses in this country alone, nobody's ever even been able to count the buildings. Uh, when we think about what we're really endeavoring to create through green schools, through the greening of these buildings, we're really thinking about the students who are coming out of these schools. And at USGBC, we like to call these students sustainability natives, students who are fluent in the language of green, who don't have to think to be green. And many of you have these students, for those of you who are educators, in your classroom, right? They're the, the students who um, you know, bully you into taking your plastic cup out of the uh, trash can and forcing you to put it into the recycling bin. Uh, if you have children who are sustainability natives, they're slipping notes under your shower door that say you've exceeded the five minute shower limit. You know, they're bugging you about why, why you're driving when you could be walking. These are the types of students that we think, that we know, green schools 
uh, create. And, and luckily, I don't have to tell you too, too much about that because um, one of the nation's foremost experts in the impact that a green school can have upon a student's education is sitting to my right, uh, with Max from, from BMDO Architects. Um, and so he will be able to tell you about some of the ways that they're uh, treating green schools as an opportunity for hands-on, project-based, experiential learning, right? I mean, we know that that's the way that students want to learn. In fact, sustainability needed, some of you uh, may, may recognize part of that. Um, we, we stole the natives piece from Mark Presky, who writes about digital natives. Right? And, and this new generation of students who want to be hands-on, who don't want to read instruction manuals, who want to discover, who don't want to uh, learn in a linear fashion. This is the kind of opportunity that green schools create. Um, you're studying ecology in your constructed wetland. You're learning about renewable energy by studying the solar panels on and monitoring um, the energy that they're producing on your roof. Um, you're studying about green buildings by participating on a lead project team um, when you're in the act of greening your school through your own coursework. Um, so this is really what we're endeavoring towards, um, and just to kind of give you a sense of programmatically what the Center for Green Schools does, um, we really define our work uh, as a breakdown in three, three different types of uh, stakeholder group outreach. People who make the case, the people who make the decisions, and the people who get things done, right? So the people who make the case, these are our grassroots advocates from our 1,000 green school committee members uh, to the students that we work with on college and university campuses through our USGBC students program. The people who make the case, admin, school administrators, facilities chiefs, superintendents, elected and appointed officials. We have many programs where we're targeting specific stakeholder groups. Uh, and the people who get things done, right? The people who are actually getting their hands dirty and making things happen from architects and engineers uh, to the uh, facilities managers uh, and, and the folks who are actually operating and maintaining the buildings. So I'll just close with this one thought, which is what's unique about speaking to you in this audience right now, as so many of you are educators or working directly with educators, is that you stretch across, in those cases, all three of those categories. So it's a really unique opportunity to talk about the sum total of what you can be doing as advocates, as decision makers, and as the people who are actually doing the teaching. Thank you, Rachel. First of all, let me thank you on behalf of the NA for letting our participants know that they are breathing healthy air while they do. Wow. Digital natives, a term we've all uh, gotten used to. I like that. Sustainability natives. It's the way to get it done. Our next panelist, Wink Knox, practices architecture in Charlottesville, Virginia. With a lifelong experience in institutional design, his specialties include courthouses, laboratories, and educational facilities. One of his most recent projects. Manassas Park Elementary School, which I understand is simply fabulous, received the 2010 American Institute of Architects National Award for Education Facility Design and an international AIA award as one of the top 10 green buildings of 2010. This LEAD Gold project has also been recognized by the NEA, the American Architecture Foundation, and numerous sustainable design publications. Most recently, the High Performing Building Magazine. Let's welcome Wick and uh, what he's going to share with us. Thank you very much. Um, it's very difficult speaking after Rachel, so it's not fair. Um, um, I, um, I would say that um, I'm an educator, but I don't think I can get away with making that claim in this room. Um, but I'm in the education business because we design schools, we design places for teaching and learning. Um, I'm lucky enough to live and work in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, with a firm called BMDO Architects, who's been designing schools for over 30 years. Um, and our practice has evolved um, as we got constantly tried to improve upon the product that we're producing to designing high-performance buildings. Um, and green schools. And I think there's a difference. Uh, high performance building and a green building aren't necessarily the same thing. I think we spend an hour talking about that. Um, 
but the thing that, um, that I think most resonates with the work that we're doing with people is the idea of the building as a teaching tool. And how are the ways that you go about constructing a place to um, get across the ideas of environmental literacy. You know, in a world of digital natives, in a world where you know, I'm not dancing out there right now, where everything can be found in this, what's the purpose of a classroom? What's a classroom supposed to look like? What's a, what's a school supposed to look like? Um, I've heard it said that in 10 years, 50% of the coursework will be available or taught online. That's a big change to what, to what a classroom would be. So um, I think what it is, is it's a place to make connections, social connections, <coughs> connections to place, to the local environment, people around you, things that you can't do digitally. Um, so it becomes, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to, um, Jerry is currently executive 
director of the NEA's Health Information Network, that is the health division of the NEA. He has raised over $30 million to develop materials and training addressing a wide spectrum of school-related health issues, from HIV AIDS prevention to teen pregnancy prevention, sexually transmitted disease infection prevention, <coughs> indoor air quality, school and gun safety, mental health wellness, and physical activity and nutrition. Before coming to the NEA, Mr. Newberry directed the sex education program for the Fairfax County Schools. He developed the Fairfax County Family Life Education Curriculum and ensured the program's compliance with the Virginia Department of Ed's standards. Let's welcome Jerry, please. I'm here to talk about sex, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, Rob will play. Um, then you're going to be more fun. Sorry about that. <laughs> Very close to that, I could talk about sex today. Um, but Wayne, thank you for your comments. Uh, uh, you apologize for your presentation, but I was intimidated by it. And, and if I had received the number of awards you have received in the last year, I wouldn't even speak. I would just <laughs> sit up here and sit up here and look pretty. Um, I just want to mention three areas, uh, sort of who we are, uh, why we believe ecological and environmental uh, literacy is important to us, and it's sort of a couple, I mentioned a couple of programs we have here at NEA's Health Information Network. Um, our mission here is to help ensure that uh, the health and safety of our 2.3, 3.2 million members who are teachers and support professionals who work in schools across America. And our history is that 24 years ago there was a, a health scare in this country. Does anyone want to make a guess what was the terrifying health scare 24 years ago? HIV. And at our convention that year, our membership voted to make NEA study this very scary thing, and that developed into this unit, um, the NEA's Health Information Network. Um, I want to mention uh, under uh, uh, why ecological and environmental literacy is important to us, uh, three areas, school gardening first of all, which I find extremely exciting that we have more and more schools stepping up to the plate to offer school gardening as a, an extracurricular and sometimes a curricular area. Um, obviously, kids can learn stewardship from their school by participating in these gardening activities. They can learn to grow vegetables. I was on a Robert Johnson fellowship of uh, about five years ago, I was in New York City in a classroom with 30 kids, middle school, eighth graders. And one of the people from the Robert Johnson Foundation said to the kids, tell me about this course. Now, I grew up on a farm. We had a half, our half acre garden that I hated because I had to garden it. And canned, you know, thousands of things a year. Uh, so, uh, good question. Silence. So the teacher says again, so would someone tell me about this course? Inner city, New York City school. One kid's school. It says, isn't that what they put on your sandwich at the subway shop? <laughs> that moment changed my view of our challenges. When we have a nation of kids in inner city schools that have not experienced vegetables to be able to even know what it is. And so I think it puts forth to us our challenge. If we're going to be talking about green, we have to start at the very base level of talking about what green is. Um, the second area I just want to mention is under the ecological and environmental literacy is how kids get to school. How do we transport kids? Um, in Fairfax County, where I uh, taught and worked, um, we had a rule that was, if you look at a two-mile radius, you had to get yourself to school. Now, sometimes parents cheated and drove you, but a lot of those kids walked two miles, two and from school every day. And we didn't know it at the time, but it was a city the county tons of money because it's a school system of 190,000 kids. But it also promoted uh, physical activity for those kids getting to and from school. Sorry about that. I turned that off my problem. Um, thirdly, uh, where was that? Um, we also want to talk about the green and high performing schools in terms of facilities that do all the things I've been mentioning on the panel, that where kids go to school in Stoddard Elementary here in Washington, D.C., we're talking about Manassas Park, they went to another green school here, and I was there, 
Uh, and there were 100 kids in the audience, and watching those kids and the pride they feel in that school, and how the school becomes part of their education system. I mean, those kids know about um, how the building is heated with high tech, thermal, geothermal, um, under the ground, and how that, that water is moved into the school, and how the school is heated and cooled through that system. And those kids are integral to that learning. Um, and then the last area I want to mention is NEA, uh, NEA programs. We have uh, a new program around nutrition, hunger, and physical activ activity here at NEA Health Information Network, where we're promoting healthy eating for schools across America. Uh, we're involved with uh, Michelle Obama's uh, Let's Move campaign that many of you are certainly know about, and many of you are actually probably quite, quite involved in that. Uh, we also have two big programs, uh, one on indoor environmental quality that we've had for some 15, 16 years. It's funded by the EPA, um, one of the government agencies here, and the goal of that program is to help those persons who work in schools, those persons who are designing schools, school board members, to look at the facility. If you're going to have um, 200, 500 squad, which can have 5,000 students and adults. If you're going to have that many people in a facility, is that facility one that is healthy for all of those participants? And then lastly, um, we have these two courses that we're rolling out about Enter Our Quality, which is on our, our, on our EA Online Academy that our members can take throughout the nation, as well as an asthma course, because we know that asthma is and has been the number one cause of squat for 29 running years. And that's directly related to the environment in which kids go to school. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Let's be Jeremy. I'm really glad, Jerry, that you made the uh, direct connection, the direct health connection as we talk about the green uh, of America and your story about subway vegetables, uh, I think, sets the stage for the urgency around many of our kids uh, throughout the country. In my group this morning, uh, when we were introducing ourselves to each other, we talked about um, what we can do with kids and adults alike so that they can really uh, become engaged in this topic. And DC, uh, in my group, offered that we should just ask questions sometimes pointed questions, sometimes open-ended questions, sometimes philosophical questions, sometimes not. So let's have our panelists wrestle with your provocative questions. As you are forming those and moving to a mic, I'm going to ask them to uh, wrestle with this one. Uh, we heard Meg talk this morning about the need to address what I believe she called environmental justice. So I'm going to just pose this to any one of the panelists. How can environmental literacy both serve and reflect the full human diversity in our nation? Well, I'll take a, I'll take a first stab. Clearly, if you look at schools, and most especially inner city schools and rural schools, and funding for those schools and the conditions in which kids attend schools, and therefore the performance of those schools. So kids who are attending inner city and rural schools often are achieving at very low levels. And that's because of a number of factors, what happens at home, what's happening in the classroom, but it also is what's happening in the environment of that school where those students attend. We know that 50% of our schools have serious indoor environmental quality. And that's, that's one of the very two schools. You know, I think this question of diversity is a really interesting one when, um, within the context of uh, environmental literacy. Um, because I actually, you know, Jerry talked about needing to start with the basics. And I don't think that I will soon forget the story that he just told about the students and, and the subway vegetables. Um, but, I, but I would like to uh, gently push back and disagree with the idea that we do have to start with the basics. I think that there's something about sustainability that is really a, can, can be used as a great equalizer. It's not a conversation about haves and have-nots. 
It's not a conversation even necessarily about how, how engaged the community is. Um, I, don't, I think that literacy, environmental literacy is critical, but fluency should really be the goal. And I think we can leapfrog over um, the literacy because in many ways to me what I hear reflected in these conversations is that literacy is about curriculum integration and it's about you know, what we're teaching across different, uh, different subject matters and what students, let's be honest, in most learning environments have to read, have to study, have to be tested on. But I think that when you're talking about this, this hands-on approach, the school facility itself as a teaching tool, every student can understand that. Every student can engage at some level with, with the learning process. So I think um, you know, it's, not, it's not enough uh, to integrate sustainability into the curriculum. And we know that you miss so many learners um, with, with the way that we're, we're teaching these days. You have to integrate sustainability into the design of the building. You have to integrate sustainability into the day-to-day -day lives of students, not just what you're teaching, um, and then the communities that they that they live in as well. Otherwise, I just I don't I don't think we'll we'll get there. We'll spend so much time on on literacy that we'll we'll never actually get to fluency. Can I say something? Uh, I I agree with you. Uh, actually, when when you think about literacy, is trying to make them communicate meaning. And I feel that every one of us can be a uh, um, change agent when we are trying to communicate what we mean to loving nature, trying to help people to stay alive on them. When we see all these floodings, these droughts, these impacts of climate change in our resources, and we think how we are going to restore what nature can, has been building for hundreds of years, is when we see the challenges that we have in front of them. We should be teaching kids to preserve and love nature and share the biodiversity that we have and the meaning of this biodiversity, not only in the natural resources, also in, with people. We are so biodiverse that we think differently, but we have to have a common goal, and this should be environmental education for preserve for life on Earth. Thank you, Carlos. I believe we have a question in the audience in the back. Any of your projects are ambitious. What I want to know is how are you able to get the most leverage out of them so they're more experienced, they're experienced by more people and it's more widespread. Well, I'd like to um, really talk about the importance of informal, <laughs> informal science education and engaging um, science museums and science centers and the educators that reside in those centers to help you push some of these programs forward. Uh, in North Carolina at the Museum of Natural Sciences, we do a lot of citizen science projects. We have a director of education internally who works with the school systems. And we do a lot with homeschoolers. And so when you incorporate informal science education and you mix that with uh, and expose children to the natural sciences, I mean, we have a full-time research staff within our museum. And the, the center that Meg is going to be the director of is really, really important because it is our nature research center. And the primary goal of that center is to expose everyday people to how research affects their daily lives. So everyday people can come in up close and personal with a scientist. They can ask questions. They can watch them in the lab. They can see them looking through the microscopes and they can ask questions. And so there is an importance to informal science education that happens outside of the classroom. And you'd be surprised how many advocates that you will receive inside of science museums that can help you push some of these programs forward. I was to add quickly that um, most of you probably know that kids are, t are tested on what they are supposed to be taught. And increasingly, um, the federal government and state governments are requiring that to be a statewide test uh, from math, science, social studies uh, that is 
tied to national standards. And what I would encourage you to do if you have any ability to influence this and, and weigh you know, in your spare time, um, to look at what we now know from the Green Movement and how we can tie those lessons learned to the national standards for science, the national standards for math, because if kids are being tested or being taught what they're being tested, and if we can get these, these topics into those tests, it will be taught. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, have a question. Right. I have a couple questions. I see one over here and one right here. Um, as as your, the panelist says, as you're answering the questions, the, the question that our student asks is such an important one, um, leveraging our resources, so I don't need to use the word scale up, but you know, when you have pockets of success, they're good. <laughs> but how do we draw that? So just kind of keep that in your mind as you're answering questions. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Safi Yesama, and I'm the director for education in the Forest Service. And uh, I am aware we have in the Forest Service a green school program. And uh, when you Google green schools, as you know, there is zillions of programs. How do we leverage and how do we tell the story, the success stories that we have in all these programs and really to bring them together and to leverage that? movement so it becomes a one movement and not a competitive uh, pieces of the movement and i like to hear from the panelists on that please the first. Um, so uh, it's a it's a wonderful question and one that we um, have spent a lot of time over the past uh, year and a half or so grappling with at usgbc um, uh, jerry was was referring to an event he was at at stoddard elementary um, that was the event to launch the Center for Green Schools at USGBC. And our hope with the Center for Green Schools is really to be uh, like a hub, a one-stop shop for these efforts and initiatives related to green schools. And I think we've done a lot of uh, different things through collaborations and programs um, that, that makes us well positioned to, to act in that role as convener in a non-competitive fashion, sharing the tremendous resources of many partners who are working on Green Schools initiatives. And I think the most powerful program um, that kind of brings that story together is really a story about why I'm sit, probably sitting up here today. Um, and that, that's through uh, the creation of something we call the Coalition for Green Schools. Um, that the executive committee for the coalition includes NEA, AFT, the National School Boards Association, NEA, HIN, uh, the Association, American Association of School Administrators. Did I get that right? Um, and and, uh, and and the National PTA and many more. So when that executive committee sits around the table on a monthly basis, and in order to to, to sign on to the executive committee, we. We really ask that everyone participate on a monthly basis. So we see folks like Jerry and Carolyn monthly to have conversations about green schools. When we all sit around the table, we represent more than 10 million members who have signed on in support of uh, green schools for everyone within this generation. And uh, with the launch of the center, we will be opening up the coalition membership to uh, anyone and everyone from uh, from a nonprofit to a government uh, entity to uh, a school district and inviting them to let us know how they're contributing um, to the Green Schools movement in a way that will allow us to tell all of those stories. Um, I think it's important to get over the, um, I'm going to call it a myth, that building green, um, building sustainable costs more. Um, it does cost maybe a little bit more, but you can build green um, at any level. Um, so I think this speaks to both the, the social justice issue and the issue of getting this out there. I mean, you can have a school system comprised of trailers, and they can be green. They can have different alkali in them and some recycled content um, and, and you've got a green system. Um, I think the other part, in terms of the outreach that organizations um, that like racial systems discussing in a lot of organizations that are, that are represented here today, I think there needs to be more outreach to maintenance and facility people, um, to the people that are in charge of cleaning these schools, the janitors, um, because you will be surprised the influence that they have on the type of buildings that we can build. Um, because they don't know how to clean it, they don't understand it, it's going to be difficult, I don't give all that glass. But if you can get them on board and show them that going to use 
less utilities and um, can actually be easier to clean, not using chemicals, then they can be really big advocates. So there's, there's places that are unexpected that I think we need to get to um, that will help us. That's wonderful. I have a question right here. Yeah, um, I, I noticed something through, oh, sorry, I'm Mitch uh, Zuckerman from Biosphere 2 at the University of Arizona, and um, I noticed something through a couple of the talks that there's sort of a, a, maybe two different ways of looking at what society is facing. One is a perspective based on place, and the other is sort of a more uh, virtual or distributed kind of education approach or understanding. And I wondered if there was a problem with sort of assuming off the bat that you can't do place-based education if it's virtual or digital or online, and if it maybe can foster a sense of place with that technology. And it might be a way of addressing some of the other questions of how you can reach out from these sort of localized successes. You can, you can certainly use technology to your advantage with place-based initiatives by simply placing a camera there that can transmit a signal across the state. And we do that at our museum with distance learning because there are some aspects in the mountains that just they can't get to us, and so but they can be reached through the place-based learning that happens at our museums. And you know, I I think that there's this resistance to technology among scientists that, quite frankly, we, you've got to move beyond that because. The segment of the population that you all really want to attract are the 18 to 29 year olds. And those are the ones, it's about 52%, those are the ones who are actively in search of new types of stories about science. But there is a hurdle. 39% of them don't necessarily tune into the news. And a lot of them get their news by either Google News Alerts or on their cell phones, or by tweeting, or following different organizations on Facebook and on Twitter. And so I would encourage you all to not underestimate the power of the internet in taking your research globally, because it is a tool that can help you in the long run, and also get the eye of the media. Uh, it's funny because, you know, in the media right now, green, sustainability, those are words right now that you're hearing a lot of. And when you want your stories to be covered, you want to go with the current trends. So use it to your advantage. Don't get caught up on, well, they're just sensationalizing it. Well, whatever works to get your message heard. And so any initiatives that you all have that tie into that green technology, sustainability, the media is kind of all over there right now, you know, in addition to bed bugs, but the media is darling right now. So really follow the current trends and really do your, do your homework and use those things to your advantage and don't underestimate the web. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you. Um, I'm Jerry Paulson. I'm a pediatrician and the director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment here in D.C. Um, school systems are one of the last um, vestiges of, of local control um, in our society here in the United States. Um, and I think it, at the national level, um, when you look at environmental health in schools, there really is nobody um, in control. The Department of Education doesn't control the Department of Health and Human Services in the context of the Centers for Disease Control don't control. The Environmental Protection Agency doesn't control. And so how do we manage to do the change that you all are talking about um, uh, to make schools an environmentally safer and healthier place for kids and for the employees um, such that we don't have to do it school district by school district by school district, because I don't know how many school districts there are in the United States, but there's a lot of them. Let me start. Um, I think there are 15,000 local school districts. Um, so yes, we, don't, we probably can't get to them. Uh, I would encourage us to start at the state level. Uh, while that doesn't always work, and trickle down doesn't trickle down in some states, a lot of states 
do, do that quite well. A lot of state uh, school boards, uh, state superintendents meet regularly with every local superintendent in that state. If we can create models at the state level that are efficient, effective, uh, and especially green, that word will get out to the local districts uh, fairly quickly. I totally agree with Jerry on this one, and um, almost. Uh, and uh, no, at uh, USGBC um, a couple of years ago started a program called the 50 for 50 Green Schools Caucus Initiative. If you're um, interested, want to do my spiel and learning more about it, the gentleman who runs that program, Nathaniel Allen from my staff, is uh, sitting right there. You'll know him when he stands up, so he'll be two heads taller than you. Um, 50 for 50 is an initiative to help. Uh, state legislators established green school caucuses within their states and in less than a year and a half we were up to 32. Is that the current count? 36 now. So inching up towards that 50 mark. And it's absolutely incredible um, what the state legislators have, have done with, with just a tiny bit of support and information. I think they're one of the most powerful and underappreciated groups in, in the country and they're just desperate for support at the local level. So thinking about um, partnering with these green school caucuses or reaching out to your state legislator is just an amazing way to enact change. And within the, the year and a half, um, the first year and a half that we launched 50 for 50, we saw the number of pieces of green schools legislation introduced at the state level increase by 150%. And many of those could be traced back to single conversations with state legislators. The state legislators that we're working with are so ignited uh, it's a bipartisan issue. Everybody likes a healthy, high-performing kid. Every taxpayer wants to support better schools. And um, some of the most incredible uh, advocates for this are, you know, not not the typical state legislators that you would expect to be um, a, a part of this. Representatives, the entire uh, legislature of Kentucky uh, unanimously created, voted to create this Green Schools legislature. I mean, just so 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 cool. Um, we had a legislator who came to us and said, you know, um, I only do this, I'm only a state legislator part-time. With the rest of my time, I'd really like to go around the country and talk to other state legislatures about why they should get engaged on green schools. Uh, because this is a legacy issue for me. Because when I look back on my time as a state legislator, I want to be able to say that green schools is what I did. Thanks, Rachel. I think we have time for one more question. Tell us who you are. Hi, uh, Jim Sarek from Lawrenceville School in uh, New Jersey. Uh, Rachel, I'm, I'm in this group, I'm in your third group of people, people who want to roll their sleeves up and get something done. And what's really a little bit frustrating about this particular conversation is <clears throat> that the, uh, the people who actually can get this job done, we're not talking about it all, which are the kids. And the kids are incredibly, um, we, we're, we're squandering a resource here because this, this is what kids want to do. This is where their heart is, and they are without the power. And so, when you have teachers who respond to that who are also without the power. So, so these changes can happen right in the classroom, but there needs to be some structure here to, to empower, especially the kids, to do it. I think that's our most underappreciated uh, resource here. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and there are some, some really wonderful engagement opportunities for students out there. Jerry was just whispering in my ear that um, at NEA and, and USGBC and a number of other groups in the room here every year are involved with School Building Week, School of the Future Design Competition, which is put on annually by the Council for Educational Facility Planners International. If you're a middle school teacher, you should really look into this program. It challenges students, middle school students, to design their dream school. They build a scale model. So the gentleman who asked the question about technology, these kids are teaching themselves how to use 3D digital modeling through Google SketchUp or AutoCAD. Um, they're building these scale models, and they are the most forward-thinking, most incredible schools. And in fact, the winning school this year, uh, winning team, was from Fairbanks, Alaska. They designed, um, they noticed that the, at the Channel River, where, which is right next to their school, um, that there were parts of the river that weren't freezing because a local plant was dumping hot water into the river. And, and so the, the, the um, wildlife there, the migratory patterns were being threatened. So they designed a heating and cooling system that's going to harvest that heat um, and redirect it to the school to provide 
to provide free heat to the school. So these, these students are, are just incredible and they got their community so inspired that now they've got people who have come on board and said, we want to help you to build that school. And actually the team that won the year before um, from a, a, a tuition-free independent school in Tucson, Arizona, where they target students um, only, only accept students who are on free or reduced lunch and target students who are at risk for gang inclusion. Um, they also are working with one of the most famous architects in the country to design and build the school that they designed um, two years ago. So the, I absolutely agree that students are an untapped resource. Um, we're working on a project where the, the LEADB, um, the Lead for Existing Building Certification that, that NEA um, went through here, we're working with students to actually become the project team that walks their, their schools through that certification process and then graduates with a green professional accreditation that will help them when they enter into the workforce. So um, clearly, clearly the students are the first place where we should be looking. Thank you, and thank you for refocusing on uh, us on the students. Uh, they are both why we need to solve the problem and as well as how we'll be able to do it. Please join me in thanking Amelia, Jerry, Rachel.